All right. I think we cracked the Facebook code this week. I'm <laughs> streaming live to my Facebook page, and I'm sharing that to our Las Vegas Triathlon Club Facebook page. And we're recording, and we'll put it up to YouTube afterwards. So for whatever reason, if it doesn't work, we'll, uh, we'll have the recording. A little technical Absolutely. issues tonight, and on your end, too. Yeah, it's it's kind of in like a Rubik's Cube <laughs> to, to solve tonight, but we, I think we got it. Yeah, I think so. And on your end, everything was just too cold, right? You had to warm up your router and get that off. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had to put my jacket on. Actually, I'm inside now. I'm gonna take, I'll take my jacket off. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a balmy 58 degrees outside here. Oh, oh. yeah. I don't think we're gonna see 68 for a while, <laughs> unless you put a one in front yep. of it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly well let's hear about the but yeah i'm gonna be back yeah oh go ahead i want to hear about the uh race a little bit more i know we talked a little bit about ahead of, uh, this ahead of time but uh we ended last week with you talking about doing a 5k race on the beach so give us a rundown how'd it go well it was a 10k first of oh, all 10K. so so that was it was actually really fun i i you know I'd never envisioned doing like a long beach run. And um, the, fortunately, it, the, well, number one, the weather was perfect. It was in like the low 60s, um, a, little, a little foggy most of the way. And um, the beach, for the most part, was relatively hard to pack. But uh, the, the tide was up a little higher than I guess they thought it was going to be. And so there was sec- a lot of, not a lot, several sections where you had to go over rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, like like jetting out into the ocean, like you either had to go through the ocean or over the rocks. <laughs> and so several several times I had to go over the rocks, and then uh, with about a half mile to go, it was there was a section that I couldn't really go over the rocks. It was so went into the ocean like up mm-hmm. to my knees, and um, yeah, just super fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, the you know I was actually really surprised. I, I finished just after 42 minutes and i was i was really happy like that's awesome. you know that's a that's a fast time on this especially on sand yeah yeah and yeah. But for me at least it was a fast time i mean there was the winner didn't like 33 minutes or something yeah. ridiculous yeah. some kid um but i was really i was really happy I, I the only real injury i came away with was blisters on my feet oh yeah. you know when you get sand yeah and wet Mm-hmm. And then my it was my left foot, so it was the left foot was down, the right foot was kind of up the entire time. You know how you're running on on a beach, and my left foot was like kind of sliding a little bit mm-hmm. every time I stepped that way. And so I got a, I, you know, I wasn't putting pressure kind of where my normal spot was. So I had a blister, but other than that, uh, I came away unscathed. And uh, fortunately, I think I ended up tenth overall and uh, won my age group. So uh-huh. it was that was super fun. Got a nice, a really nice travel mug uh, yeah. as a prize nice and uh so yeah, it was all good um i don't know like it's been so fun this summer you know i've been traveling around everywhere and trying to do different events yeah. and you know just meet people and it's 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 been a lot of fun um you know i yeah it's just it was it was it was a super fun event but there was over 700 people that ended up doing mm-hmm. the race mm-hmm. and it's a the races that have been going on for this was the 54th year of the race wow that's great yeah so it's pretty iconic here. Yeah. It's a neat way to reset, you know, uh, racing. And what's, you know, what's interesting, I was going to say, oh, this is your introduction to, to adventure racing, but you have a long history of doing orienteering. And so that's actually uh, not new to you. You didn't need a map though, right? You just, you kept the ocean on no. your left. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ocean is on the left, beach on the right, and just, yeah. and just go. It was it was really fun because like a few times you kind of just get into this mellow feeling of running, you know, like you just kind of get in your zone. And I wasn't really paying attention to the waves. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're, you're supposed to never like turn your back on the ocean. But there's a few times I'm like, oh my gosh, last minute had to take a hard right because yeah. you know you don't, especially when your feet are somewhat dry, yeah. you don't want to get them wet again. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it just it was once again fun to do something like out of the ordinary and um, yeah, just. I don't know. I, I felt some, sometimes when you race, you know, you just kind of feel alive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I just kind of felt alive that day. And it, so, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it, it was pretty special. Well, what's neat about doing a race like that is there's no expectation. You can't, you know, even, you know, you say it's a 10 K, but whatever the time is, you, 
it me is meaningless because it, it's not going to compare it to a road race type of time and and that's okay and sometimes taking that emphasis off that performance goal even though you're still focused on doing really well you know that that, that can change things nicely and it can be uh, refreshing and a nice way to reset yeah, the, it was funny the night before I was talking to my neighbors and they're like, well, what kind of time do you think? I'm like, I don't know, maybe 46, 47. I, mean, I had no idea. Like, yeah. Yeah. On the stand, and there was no there was no expectations. I just mm-hmm. I just you know, got into a groove. And then, you know, like you get around different people and you're yeah. passing some people, you're being passed by other people and you're, you're, you're racing, you know, and um, it was fun. It, honestly, it was it was refreshing let's call that's that good. that's good well and hopefully your your shoes can still be used after this so <laughs> they're not yes once they, you get sand in they them, absolutely can. it's like it will ever you'll always have sand in your shoes so <laughs> it, it, it's so funny you said that because i'm like okay those are my new trail running shoes you know because <laughs> because i did i did a trail run yesterday in them and i'm like yep there's still sand from yeah <laughs> even though i've washed them i've cleaned them there oh. will forever be sand in them no, that that's true. So true. All right. So, well, tonight we wanted to talk about training, not, not for a beach run, but yeah. just training in different segments. You came up with this topic. You want to give an overview? Yeah. So it's a really, I think it's a really interesting topic because it's a question I get from athletes all the time. It's how should I train for this race versus this race? And then we're talking about distances. Mm-hmm. Now that with we, we are adding in, there's more and more of these super sprint races as well. So we're looking at this kind of the gamut of a super sprint triathlon all the way to an Ironman. I've actually never coached anybody that's done longer than an Ironman, but that's a big, there's a big difference mm-hmm. in the actual race, right? Even if we don't take the super sprint, if we just say from sprint to Ironman and you know, what is the difference? Um, you know, I have an athlete right now that's looking to do their first full Ironman and they've been doing a lot of 70.3s. And we start talking about, well, the difference, the difference in the training is what, mm-hmm. and this is a really, I mean, John, this is a, this is a big topic in triathlon yeah. and we've never really touched on it because there's a lot of nuance to it. Mm-hmm. Right. So depending on, it depends on what your goals are. Are your goals for this full Ironman to, you know, win Kona, mm-hmm. right. Or if we're talking about a sprint race, is your goal to go and win a local sprint race? Or is it a goal to go and win nationals um, for a sprint race? And so there's one thing, there's there's nuance to it. Um, but anyways, that's kind of the, an overview of it. Well, I love it. So yeah. I'll ask. I'll ask right. Oh, sorry. I don't know if it's my, it might actually be on my side that we're getting a lag too. So but we'll do the best we can tonight. Uh, yeah, no, I love this topic because um, you're a nice, nice overview because yeah, going from a 70.3 to a full, you don't just do it two times everything because you won't, right. you won't be able to survive if you're trying, because a lot of people put in some serious time to do well at a 70.3 and you can't just double everything. And same thing, you know, for doing a sprint race, it doesn't mean you just take, you know, whatever a quarter, um and and you know drop it down uh but obviously whether you're training for a sprint versus olympic for 70.3 versus uh, a full those each have uh, they share things in common but then there's also some unique ways to approach uh, each race yeah i i totally agree um and, you know and as i came uh, or thinking about this topic I started thinking about, you know, probably what you really need to do is do a self-evaluation first, mm-hmm. right? You need to evaluate where you're at. Yeah. And um, let's hypothetically say, let's, let's take you or I. So you and I probably right now are doing mostly, our, our bigger races are 70.3s. Right. Would you agree? I agree. Yep. Yeah, totally. So let's hypothetically say you came to me or I came to you and I said, I want to do a sprint race mm-hmm. and I want to go to like us nationals and do the best sprint race I can do. And I want, I want that to be my a race of the year. Yeah. But you know, and I've been doing 70.3s. I've done many 70.3s. What would I have to do to change my training to excel at a sprint race? Yeah. 
Um, I think that's a good, that's a good, good, that's a good place to start. Yeah, no, totally. And I think to answer the question, it's good to give some context of a training program. And I mean, obviously you're working with, with athletes, you have training volume, you've got to address training intensity, you've got to address training duration for any particular session. And then you have your key workouts. Somehow you've got to work in some strength um, and, and then even touch on uh, the nutrition aspect. And so somehow you've got to build out that program for that type of, of event. For So for a sprint event, how would that differ knowing that you have a strong base for 70.3? You know, first thing that comes to my mind is intensity <laughs> for a sprint race. And, and knowing that you want to be competitive and you want, want to do really well, there has to be some real um, attention paid to including intense workouts at a race pace or or even faster than race pace where do you start i love it. I, I love it because that is the answer everyone gives mm -hmm. right so it's got to be more intense well when where how like, you, like exactly like what are the what are what are what are the metrics behind it and how much is enough Mm -hmm. Um, I was listening to, uh, once again, let's do a podcast and it was, it was a guy that he's coaching, uh, a, a couple Olympians that are doing, uh, 1500 and 3000. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, sh basically sharing their workouts and their volume. And I mean, it, it's funny, other than the, the a few track workouts that they were doing, the volume was very similar to a triathlete. Mm -hmm. like to a 70.3 triathlete, like the amount of, you know, the amount of volume, probably the run volume was even higher at low intensity. And so this really does beg the question of is a sprint race, like how, how much intensity do you need if you have a really good aerobic base already? Mm -hmm. And because so, once again, it is aerobic, right? We're talking yeah. in a sprint race that if you want to win nationals or you want to be really good at nationals, you're looking at an hour long race. So an hour, that's, that's a long time to be, to be exercising. So you have to be thinking about FTP, right? On So we talk about FTP on the bike, but FTP for your body, like what's your, what's your threshold for an hour swim, mm -hmm. bike and run. Yeah. And so I, that's, that's kind of where I would start is start thinking about like, how do we raise the threshold not necessarily how do I um, get the 5K faster, get the bike faster, get this. Like I'm, I'm thinking physiologically, how do I raise the ability to be at my, basically at my limit for an hour? Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I, where I start with. What are your, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I think, I think we're actually saying the same thing, just using different terms because to raise your threshold, You've got to train above your threshold, but also have that base that is below threshold as well. And, and I think something else that you and I have talked about and really adhere to is the knowledge of being able how to run fast or bike fast or swim fast and being able to train the brain to be able to operate at that race pace or, like I said, or faster. It doesn't mean to go run 5Ks for that, that intensity, but you need to expose the brain to some of these paces that uh, you're going to try to, to use during a, during a sprint race. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think that you're right. Like, I think you need to do some work about threshold, but I think you need to do a lot of work right around threshold mm -hmm. for, the, for the sprint race. And probably not, like, I think some people go to the, the thought process of, well, 5k runners, they do a bunch of stuff like the you know, 400 meter repeats and 200 meter repeats. Um, so it's, which is quite a bit above threshold, but once again, we're not five, we're not five K specialists, right. right? We're, we're trying to do this probably a little bit slower mm -hmm. um, because once again, you're not going to be 100% fresh when you, when you get to that point. So I would personally, I would kind of look at the, maybe the one K, um, repeats versus like a 400 or a 200 repeat mm -hmm. um, as you know, right around the threshold speed or right around the goal running speed for the race. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, once again, if you want to win nationals at our age, age groups, um, I'm guessing I'm just going to throw this out for my age group. It's probably you have to run a 17 minute 5k. Yeah. Right. Just, I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. So 
could I do one one k repeats at that at that pace? Mm -hmm. You know, if 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 it's even ten, possible, because no. if I can't do one k at that pace, I definitely can't do five k at that no, at, at that right. pace. Well, I think this goes back to where you started. You talked about doing an assessment of where you are and, you know, where, where I am and where you are, we've done mostly 70.3s, maybe some Olympics, maybe a sprint here and there or sprint race. Uh, but we haven't focused on that for years, probably. And so, you know, for me, I know if I was going to go back to, to really focus on sprints, I would need to start introducing some short, even shorter than 1K runs at race pace, or you know, the, the target race pace that I'd be shooting for. Uh, because yeah, I don't know if I could, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know what would happen if I would uh, try to, to get down under 20 minutes and uh, on a 5K uh, right, right from the get go, I'd need to start introducing that stress in slowly into the, back into the training uh, program. And I find this really intriguing because everyone goes to like the intensity thought process on the run, mm -hmm. right? But then if we look at it yeah. in the swim, if I can't swim, so if it's a 750 swim mm -hmm. and I can't swim 50 meters at that pace, same kind of thing, right? Like the, the pace I'm going to need to get out of the water. And once again, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. And then, so how do I become faster at swimming 750? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, so once again, it's assessing where you're, where you're truly at and can you actually do it? Right. So like to run 17 minutes, I actually don't think I can do that. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's beyond me back in the day. Could I maybe, mm -hmm. right. Um, the 750 swim, uh, what's that like for an elite eight minutes, mm -hmm. seven, five, eight minutes. Yeah. I, once again, I don't think for for me personally, I don't think that that's in the cards. And if it was, if I, if I really focused on that, I'd probably have to only swim. Yeah. Probably, you know, for probably a year and, and then maybe, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think, yeah, well, going back to the assessment of where, of where you are. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned this because I'm thinking ahead to next year's corporate challenge. And that the corporate challenge is a swim meet that we go and do. Uh, and, you know, that our 50s, 100s, 200 you know, yard distances. Well, I've been able to win every event in my age group for the last whatever, or I don't know, probably since I started doing them again in, in 40, uh, 40 years old. And so now, though, someone below me is about to age up and he's faster than me. And I've done no sprint work out going into this corporate challenge because it is just what it is. And so now I know I need to train differently for that corporate challenge, but I'm going to pick a window in which I'm going to do that. I'm not going to start now because corporate challenge isn't until April. So, you know, obviously I've got about eight months prior to that, uh, but I need to start introducing uh, some ways to swim faster and hopefully get regain some of the speed. <laughs> We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So, so once again, it's an, it's an assessment, right? And, and it's an assessment and all the things that we've ever talked about on this podcast still hold true. Yeah. Right. It's going to take consistency. It's going to take um, volume. It's going to take intensity. I mean, there, all these pieces are, are, are still going to hold true. Oh, one of us is hanging I think it might be me. Okay. Oh, there, that's better. Well, let me let me ask this question to you then. Now, see, now it says my internet's unstable. So I don't know if it's me as well, maybe it's both of us. Um, talking about doing a sprint, what type of window would you want to have to work with an athlete given that they have a base and that they want to shift from doing long distance event to this sprint event, what type of, of window would you look at from, you know, in terms of number of weeks? Man, that is set. That is like, that's the million dollar question because <laughs> I want as much time as possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like really it, it, as, as just purely like a, a coach, I'd say, you know, give me 12 weeks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I know I could do it in probably six. Yeah. But 12 would be yeah. better. Yeah. And, 
Uh, we do know like the neurologic system and the neuromuscular system, especially at when you're working at speed can be trained relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas endurance takes you know, potentially decades to, yeah. to completely build out. We can actually return to speed relatively quickly, neuro neuromuscularly. Mm -hmm. The issue that I always come to though, is the risk of injury. Mm -hmm. Once again, especially, especially running too fast, too often. And it's not that you can't become a faster runner in that time uh, neuromuscularly. It's more, can your tendons and actually the muscle itself, the fibers of the muscle, can they actually handle the forces you're going to be applying on it? Mm -hmm. And so going back to the conversation we had last week, using something like a lever or a, a, um, a body weight support treadmill might actually be the key to yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, actually doing this. Yeah, especially if you have your physiological base. Okay, now let me flip it. Let's say you're yeah. working with someone who's an elite at the sprint distance. They're winning races, maybe their age group, whatever, uh, and they want to now move up to an iron distance event. What type of window would you want then uh, for that athlete? Three years. <laughs> no, yeah. seriously, I'd want three years. Yeah. Once again, and, and, and I'm looking at this, they're, they're, they have the champion mindset, right? Like they've been winning. They're mm -hmm. at the top of their game. Yeah. And I'm assuming they're going to want to go to an Ironman and podium. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a different, like, I'd want three years for that. If you said just to complete an Ironman, I'd want, I'd want one season. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. well, so I think once again, I think goals are really important to, to look at there, you know, and the, and the mentality of the person, mm -hmm. you know, if, the, if they're this person that, Hey, I got to win everything. I want to win. I want to win. I want to win. I got to be realistic and say, this is a three-year process. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. Is, 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 that, is that fair? No, totally. I, I, I think that I love that answer and that, yeah, well, you want that long window, but if you needed to just complete an event or you wanted to check a box, uh, then that time window is, is uh, quite uh, shorter because the challenge with the longer distance is getting someone to run slower <laughs> as opposed yeah. to trying to find that top end speed. You're trying to find that speed that you can sustain for a long period of time with a sprint. You just need to sustain it for, like you said, an hour, you know, in, in, in each discipline, you know, a, a subset of that. So trying to find that that speed that you can sustain for a long time, I think is much harder than it is to try to find your top end speed. Yeah, well, and, and we talked about it already, but it's the aerobic development that you need to go. Let's say you want to, like once again, win your age or be on the podium to go sub 10 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, really, cause you're at like maybe 75 to 80% of threshold for 10 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That takes a long, long time to build up. Yeah. And once again, if, if you came to me and said, Hey, I just want to finish and we can, I plan on walking a significant amount and, mm -hmm. uh, I don't really care about my bike split. I don't like, really, you know, I just, I want to finish like 15, 16 hours. That's a different situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, but true, like aerobic development to be able to withstand not just the aerobic load, but also like the the fatigue management, mm -hmm. uh, especially during the marathon and the back half of the bike. That takes a long time to build up. Yeah. Yeah. Like in like year. And the 15 to 16 hours is still an admirable achievement oh yeah and it's it's just a different type of achievement than trying to be at that threshold pace for nine hours ten hours or whatever it ends up being for whatever each group they're shooting for and uh and that, that's hard that's hard to develop it and stay injury free and uh and hard to find it as well so you know the this is a really interesting topic and, and we haven't talked much about fatigue resistance Mm -hmm. fatigue resistance is um it, it, they measure it in cycling a lot and and actually it's one of the metrics that pro world tour teams use to determine if you're going to be great or not when you're young mm 
Mm-hmm. And basically they do a test where they'll, they'll have you do like 2,500 kilojoules of activity and then do an FTP test. Mm-hmm. Nice. Right. And because we're doing it fresh. Well, you're never in a world tour team doing something fresh mm-hmm. and you know, like other than maybe a short time trial, but these are long races and the same with an Ironman. It's like, what can you do after you've burned 4,000 kilojoules? Yeah. And there's a genetic component to it, but there's also like a training component to fatigue resistance. That is that once again, I believe takes several years uh, to build up and it's yeah. not just fatigue resistance in the race. It's fatigue resistance for the, the volume of training you need to do at some, some intensity, really, if you're going to be going sub 10 hours. Mm-hmm. I love it. So let me ask that next question that, that this is sort of begging that to be asked, how would you approach recovery if you're training for a sprint versus an iron distance recovery within the training program? Uh, give us, give us some thoughts on, uh, on how you approach that. Man, you, you're trying to get all my secrets out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because they both need significant recovery, mm-hmm. right? If you're doing more intense stuff, there's, there's damage to the mm-hmm. system that needs to be repaired. If you're doing a lot of volume, there's a lot of damage that occurs to the system. Mm-hmm. So I actually, this was a quote that I, I heard somewhere a while ago that pro athletes aren't paid to train. They're paid to recover. Mm-hmm. Right. So the, the pro, the pro athlete, and when I say that is, is, you know, their, their work day, maybe they may only train four hours. Mm-hmm. Well, then the rest of the time they're getting paid is to sit around and do nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. And whereas most people, they got to go to work and they got to do all these other things. So we definitely do need to prioritize recovery. And so I would almost be willing to say there's not much difference mm. in, in the recovery. If it's done, it, if, because once again, the intensity versus the volume yeah, yeah. is kind of the, is kind of. Maybe you yeah. would have a bit more time if you're doing the sprint focused training only to work in recovery, but yeah. with your iron distance plan, you've got to, you've got to make sure that you're carving that time out and treating recovery as a training session in yeah. essence. All right. So yeah, now no, I, I, I agree. Okay. So now you talked a little bit about this hypothetical athlete preparing that was winning at the sprint and trying to the mental aspect, but how about mental training for someone who is trying to focus on sprints versus, uh, versus a, a full, how do you approach that? Uh, well, I love this. I, I love this thought because, you know, um, I have a friend that doesn't like doing sprint racing because it hurts too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he also doesn't want to do an Ironman because it's going to hurt too much. Yeah, different pains. Right? <laughs> the, the Olympic distance in seventy point three, it it's kind of like it's it's kind of like the like the, the the point where you're not really working so yeah. hard. Yeah. But it's not so long. You know. You know what I mean? And so yeah. so, I think that there's a there's a there's a mental toughness to both of those that need to be developed. So mm-hmm. on the sprint side, looking at you know can you sustain maximum effort for an hour? Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I mean, I love, and you know, we've talked about this before. I love doing Zwift races Mm -hmm. where you would do an hour race. So there, you know, there, there's a few of the uh, courses that have like an hour long climb, basically. Okay. I want you to race that and for an hour and I want you to try and win, you know what I mean? Like, and so you're going to be basically on your threshold for that complete time Mm -hmm. or go run a 10 K race. Mm -hmm. So can you do a 10 K at your personal best and that feeling of how bad that feels when you're at your limit for that time, I think that can help prepare you. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the distance stuff, once again, I like doing things like the, um, I call them fatigue resistance where let's say for an Ironman, you're going out for a six hour bike ride Mm -hmm. and the last hour is the hardest hour. Right, 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 and 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 is it physiologically doing a lot to you? Maybe, but maybe it's the mental side, right? Mm-hmm. Like, 
I'm crushing myself now so I can prepare myself mentally for what yeah. that's going to feel like. Yeah. And you talk about that. The reason we're doing this is to get you in this state of mind where things are going to be hurting. Things are not going to be feeling good, but you can continue. You can persist. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. And, and anecdotally, that's where, like, if I went back when I was doing a little bit more on the sprinting side of things, I'd run at paces, not necessarily to run that pace, but more so get that mindset of what it's like to run a certain pace. I know that sounds odd, like I'm double speak there. And same thing on the bike. You know, this is what it feels like to bike 270 watts, whatever, and just have the mindset of that perception of that effort. And at the sprint race, really trying to um, understand that link between perception and, and the effort that I was putting into, into it. And I think, I think you're spot on. Right? You've, you've got to have that type of, of mental sharpness to be able to do sprint races at those paces. And then it's a different type of mental sharpness for a full. There you're trying to make sure that you're still able to make decisions that you're evaluating throughout the race and you're you're you know adapting as you need to adapt uh whereas in a sprint race you you, you don't have time to adapt usually you've got a you, you've got to be hitting on all cylinders but in this you know being successful at the longer races you do need to have that ability to adjust whatever that adjustment ends up being yeah the other area in the long race that i that i try and prepare people for and even myself and i've done longer races is patience Mm -hmm. yeah yeah actually being patient mm -hmm. and so once again like going up for that six hour bike ride and keeping it mellow mm -hmm. you know when somebody rides by you you don't jump on their wheel and you don't get you know yeah. and you're you know if your goal for the day is 150 watts mm -hmm. average power yeah you keep it you know between 140 and 160 and you know like and that's the patient mindset because you could go do more Mm -hmm. and um I, john it's funny I, I often think of the first time uh you and i rode together and we did the century we went out to, to searchlight yeah yeah and my goal i still remember that my goal for that day well just so everybody knows john had a mechanical his uh, de front derailleur <laughs> and then i had, i broke mine actually in the last like five miles so it was really a weird thing we both broke the derailleurs um <laughs> But my goal was to to say I want to hold 200 watts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for, for that whole ride, yeah. and it was actually a silly goal. Yeah. Like looking back now, I think I should have done like 160, 170 watts. Mm -hmm. And it was like, but I didn't know enough. I was like, okay, like you know, it was just like this nebulous number, yeah. rather than 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 something else. And you know, the aerobic system, like my, my heart rate was too high at that, mm. you know, at that thing, but I, just, I knew Watts. I knew, okay, I want to race because my goal and the, and the, and the race wasn't for another, I think it was months down the road. Yeah. My goal for the race at that time was to, to ride at 200 Watts, Okay, but I didn't need to be doing that for the development of my aerobic system. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it just caused me to have more fatigue. And so, so anyways, there, there's, there's a, there's a bit of patience that needs to be added in. And, um, you know, we talked about this a little while ago too, like the slower running and mm -hmm. being patient, even though, you know, you can run faster. Mm -hmm. Like you get yourself a two hour run lined up on a Saturday and yeah. your coach says, Hey, I want you to run at 10 minute pace. And you're like, well, I could easily run this at eight thirty pace. Oh, we know you could. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. But can you be patient enough to do yeah. the aerobic development? To also understand that you're going to probably be racing right around that pace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even though it's like it can be very frustrating to run slow yeah no, I love it. yeah it, it, the patience that's needed or even the patience in the pool right mm -hmm. john very few people like to swim four thousand straight in the pool no very few <laughs> yeah but i would contend to, to prepare for an iron man you probably should do that a few times just for the patience that's right mm -hmm. no i don't i love this and, and i think i think you're spot on that you, preparing for a race you got to have the right mantra during the race and during the sprint 
there's certain things that you tell yourself to make sure that you're at that top end speed that you can sustain. But during an iron distance event, it's all about trying to stay calm and patient because it's a long day. And if you start trying to stress on the swim and try to hit a buoy before someone, you know, you've got a long day ahead of you. And uh, and it is, a, you know, really a matter of, of being patient and, and and letting the race come to you. And that takes time to figure that out. That's not easy uh, to do during training or during racing. All right, how about- um, but once again, I think you need to train it. That's all I'm, that's yeah, all I'm yeah, saying. It's, yeah. it's, it's not just gonna happen naturally. No, that's right. Be very purposeful on that. I love that. How about um, what you're going to monitor and or evaluate during your training program for either a sprint or for fall? Oh, that's such a good. That's such a good question because you know we we look at these numbers like TSS and um, you know so I would still look at those like what's the what's mm -hmm. the training load you yeah. know what's 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 the acute versus chronic training load. I think that that's really important. Um, I think in this, in either case, you can do too much. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem ends up being doing too much always. Yeah. It's very rarely when somebody, at least when they hire a coach mm -hmm. or they, they're taking this quite seriously, that they don't do enough. Mm -hmm. It happens, but very, very rarely does the, do I, do I see that happen? So I think that a lot of times it really comes down to looking at, you know, acute versus chronic load. Um, are we actually having recovery days mm -hmm. built in? I still believe really strongly in the recovery week that yeah. depending on the person and their injury history and whatever, every three or four weeks, you need a, a, a recovery week mm -hmm. in either side, either sprint or, um, or, or long distance. So I think that that, that, that side is relatively, uh, relatively similar. Obviously the training load is going to be higher, even if the intensity is greater with a sprint race, the, um, the, the actual load is going to be greater on the body, mm -hmm. um, or long distance. Um, I would also look at, we've talked about before ramp rates. Yeah. Um, in a sprint race, I might actually say, you know what, especially if we're going into those last, like, four, five, six weeks, the ramp rate might actually go pretty high because I'm going to be adding significant intensity at that point. Whereas an Ironman, my ramp rates are going to be really, I want them really subtle. Like, you know, ramp rates of two, three, four um, percent per week, basically. And just, um, give, just for people who may not know ramp rate, just give a, a quick synopsis of that. The easiest way to think about ramp rate is, it's, I mean, if you had a hundred blocks of time for time and intensity, so mm -hmm. volume, um, in this week, the next week, if it was a ramp rate of 4%, you'd do 104. Mm -hmm. And then the next week it was 4% again, it would be 104.4 or 108.4, right? Uh, it would just adding a little bit, being 4% more load per week, basically. I like that. Um, yeah. We, we, we run into problems with people when they start seeing ramp rates for a long period of time at six, seven, eight, nine, some people will do 10. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we run into uh, to, to problems because our body can't adapt. Basically it's, we're trying to predict the, the adaptation of the body to yeah. increase increasing loads. Yeah. Yeah. And minimize that risk of injury. Okay. How about another topic that that's good to talk about for each and that's nutrition. We, we talked a little bit about it, but nutrition, how would you approach that working with an athlete focusing on sprint versus focusing on a uh, fall or 70 points? Oh my gosh. You're, you're really taking the, 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 the wide range here. Cause I was like, I, I was actually thinking maybe more even like the difference between a 70.3 and an Ironman. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. If you, if you really want to take it really, really wide, mm -hmm. like many sprint athletes will take on basically nothing during right, the race. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Do an hour with nothing. If so, as long as you've prepared properly, yeah. you know, you have glycogen stores that, for an hour. So you, you almost need nothing. Mm -hmm. So let's take it from a 70.3 to an Ironman. Okay. Well, no, I, I wanted to, I wanted to make that distinction. Oh, you no, know, okay. totally. Because the nutrition for the sprint, it's not during the race that you got to pay attention. It's before right. the race that you got to pay attention. Not only you know the hours leading up to the race, 
but the week before the event, two weeks before that, that nutrition prior to the event is where you're paying attention to. But for a 70.3 or a full, you've got to not only monitor that, but you've got to monitor and know what you're doing during the event. Okay, so now go into 70.3 versus a full. That's good. Yeah, so I actually think that, you know, 70.3, you, you're, you are allowed to, and you will, well, maybe not will, you'll make mistakes with your nutrition yeah. and you can get away with it yeah, for the most part. Right? <laughs> but in, a, in a full Ironman, if you make mistakes, especially early, especially on the bike, you will pay for it. Mm -hmm. And you I mean, I would, I'm just going to throw this out and I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think a majority of the DNFs that occur in Ironman racing occur in the run. You know, they get, they get to the run. And I would say a majority of those, and I'm just throwing this out from people I know, it's nutrition issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would it, does you know, the stats say there's probably 80, maybe even 90% of iron distance competitors complain about GI problems. Now the GI problems yeah. range, and I've looked at the data on this and surveys, and it's hard to pinpoint it, you know, you can put all those complaints into a bin of GI problems, but there's different subsets of bins within that GI problem, and uh, they're, they're still pretty quite varied uh, within a full. But no, I, I think you're spot on that that's going to lead to your your DNF rate, unless you're swimming Morro Bay or <laughs> exactly. But 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 and I also say it's not even just GI issues, right? It's energy availability, mm -hmm. right? If if you didn't eat enough on the bike. And you didn't get you didn't get enough nutrition and you didn't get enough calories in in the run in the beginning of the run it becomes really really hard to finish yeah, yeah. you know and, like and spot on and i think that's where when they when you look at the research and they say gi problems one of the gi problems is you can't take in anything more and so now you can't have or, that or you didn't or you or you just didn't take in enough right because mm -hmm. i i've heard of this with many people, they look look back at their after they get off the bike, or sorry, after they don't finish, and they go back to their bike and they see all of their gels. Oh yeah, yeah, still mm -hmm. taped to their bike, mm -hmm. and you know they just were like, well, they made a decision during the bike. Well, maybe they were I don't know what it was, maybe they were riding too hard or whatever the case may be, and they're like, oh, I'm going to only do uh, fluid. They make they, they make kind of a decision. In the heat of the race, mm -hmm. and so then now they're like seven hundred grams of carbs or seven hundred calories below where yep. their goal was and where their plan was, and mm -hmm. then they start the run and then get it back into their plan. But they're in such a deficit that your muscular system kind of shuts down a little bit on them, and it's not even a GI issue. It's just purely like they just don't have they don't have the calories to do to support the intensity that they planned on racing at. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're, you know, hypothetically, they're running, let's say a nine minute mile. And that was the plan. And that turns into a 12 minute mile mm -hmm. and not because of anything other than just like they're changed energy systems into, you know, pure fat burning because they've lost all of their glycogen and mm -hmm. their body's sparing it for its brain and um, the neurologic system. And so, you, you, you know, what I'm getting at with that. So I think in an Ironman, that's a real, both of those issues are, are really, really important. In a 70.3, once again, I think you can make some mistakes and get away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you I, agree? Oh, totally. It's, you know, it's a duration issue. And, uh, you know, when you're racing an Ironman, Iron Distance event, most of us are doing that 10 hours plus. There's, a you know, a number of people that, that are maybe watching this podcast and uh, are under 10 hours, but most people will do it over 10 hours. I think the average time is 12 to 13 hours. It's, you know, course dependent. And that's a long time to eat a Snickers bar. <laughs> you know, that's a long thing. You know, this is how I introduce it to my class. I mean, you're eating, in essence, a Snickers bar for breakfast, snack, lunch, post-lunch snack, and a dinner. And by the end of the day, you're just like, I can't eat this Snicker bar anymore. And I never want to see a Snicker. And I know Snicker bar is not what people are eating, but just for the sake of, of uh, connecting with students, they understand what uh, what a Snicker bar is. Uh, and so th this is the, you know, one of the issues with, with iron distance events is trying to get that nutrition down. But on a 70.3, I think you're right, you, you can, have a little bit more wiggle room in terms of of uh, of making a mistake and still be able to recover 
partly because it's a, it's a duration issue. I'm going to add a, a little piece to this. And you know, so obviously Lake Placid was last weekend, right? Mm -hmm. So let's hypothetically say you went to Lake Placid and you flew in on Thursday and you raced on the Sunday race. Yeah. Yep. Sunday. Anyway, your circadian rhythms are also way off. That's right. So start time is 6 a.m. You're yeah. waking up at four to have breakfast. Well, that's 1 a.m. our time. So, so you're eating at a completely different time than you normally would. Well, I know you like to stay up late, so you do eat at 1 a.m., but most people that are training, they don't. So <laughs> then, so, so think about it. So you're at 1 a.m. breakfast. Now it's 3 a.m. race start. Mm -hmm. You do an hour swim. You're at 4 a.m. Okay, our time. Yeah. What time is breakfast? Hit? About two hours into the bike is mm -hmm. when you think you should be having breakfast and you're just eating you know, you're eating Snickers bars, uh, you're eating sports nutrition, right, right, right. Right? but you're used to having your granola and your yogurt and your, yeah. this, this meal. Right. And then now let's fast forward four hours when it's your lunchtime, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're always going to be off and you're off of what your body is naturally going to be expecting. And we know that the circadian rhythm is really, really important for you know, the, the things that break down the food that we are taking in, like the enzymes and, and the transporters within the small intestine and all of those play, play a role. So once again, iron distance, you can't, you've got to figure that stuff out. Yeah. And so, you know, and you know, like a pro athlete, a lot of them, they go to races really early, especially when they have to change time zones. And we think, well, it's jet lag. Well, some of it's jet lag, but some of it's actually the the gastrointestinal system and getting it used to a new time zone and a new time of doing things um so i think that 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 would be a big difference between a sprint race honestly a sprint race i wouldn't make any changes just you know i'm traveling across the country to sprint race okay well whatever i'm gonna have the same breakfast i would normally have i'm gonna have a gel right before i hit the swim mm -hmm. i'm gonna have a little bit of gatorade to drink on the bike and yep. that's it and there's there, you know there's no there's really a little thought process that needs to get to occur yeah very very different approach by the way we do have a listener request to do more on nutrition so we are going to dive into this topic a yep. bit more and get some more experts uh on the podcast about nutrition okay one more area that i have to sort of compare and contrast okay. um well maybe maybe two but I'm, i'll put them together um transitions and gear how do you approach yes. transitions and gear from a training perspective but obviously a race perspective too for a sprint focused athlete versus a iron distance focused athlete and that is that's deep let's just talk about gear to start okay because let's, let's break um, th because there's a lot of nuances tra with transition whether it's you know is it a clean transition? Is it bags? Is it, you know, you know what I mean? So let's just talk about gear. And this is actually really interesting um, because like I would potentially choose different things, right? Like if I know I'm going to be out on a run for five hours or four hours mm -hmm. and I know it's going to be sunny, I would for sure go with a long sleeve top now. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like yeah. I want my arms covered. Um, I would definitely have a hat on. Whereas in a sprint race, I often wouldn't wear a hat. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, I'm only gonna be running for 20 minutes. I don't, you know, I feel like I've got some sunscreen from before. I don't really, you know, don't need that protection. So I look at like, th or I look at protection, uh, from the sun, but I also look at thermal issues, mm -hmm. um, with a long race, especially the heat. like I would always, we talked about this before, I'd always wear white. Whereas in a sprint race, I wouldn't care. Right? I'm not worried about the thermal impact of the of the of the 20 minute run. Mm -hmm. So I make those decisions. I make potentially even footwear decisions. Historically, I would. I think that nowadays everyone's wearing you know carbon plated shoes for both. But mm -hmm. historically, I would run run maybe more like in a running a, a racing flat for a 5k versus like a, a thicker sole shoe. Mm -hmm. um, I don't wear socks right in a sprint race. No socks in a in an iron day race, I would absolutely mm -hmm. uh, have socks. Um, it's actually a, an interesting, so the interesting thing. So I, uh, one of the options of doing when I was in California here was to do a, a race this weekend. It was uh, going to be a sprint triathlon that was really even shorter than a sprint. They actually canceled it. So it was going to be this weekend. Oh, okay. And I was like, okay, well, I don't need an arrow. I don't need an arrow helmet. It was an eight mile bike ride. I don't need to pack my arrow helmet. Mm -hmm. I don't need my disc wheel. I don't need my, like, 
all these little things that they're that over a long distance race are yeah. they're going to be time gains but mm -hmm. it's not worth even packing for mm -hmm. you know right or i i don't need my race tires i'm not gonna put race tires on i'm not gonna put my race chain on for a, for, for something that doesn't not it's not as important but if i was going to the sprint nationals mm -hmm. i would absolutely have all of that stuff so yeah. i guess it, it's more depending on with a shorter race like how serious i'm taking it is it a c level you know we talk about like c races b races a races mm -hmm. oftentimes for us like our sprint racing is like c's and b level yeah, yeah. and our long distances are our a race but it, it, but if the a race is a short distance then you know you're gonna potentially have a bunch of that stuff what, what are your thoughts on that no oh, i love it for swim my gear is in essence going to be the same uh, it's all going to be, you know, what you, if it, if what you are allowed, I'm wearing a wet suit. Probably one piece of gear I would not use in a sprint would be a hoodie. If the water were, you generally for an iron distance event, if the water's below 60 degrees, I'm putting a hoodie on. I'm just more comfortable swimming, at, you know, with a, a hoodie for that period of time, you know, with the iron distance, an hour in the water, whatever. Um, you know, having having a bit of comfort during the swim is important for a sprint. No hoodie. You just uh, just go with it. But my wetsuit would be the same and, and goggles, obviously, the same. For the bike, uh, for a sprint race, no down to bottle, uh, no flat gear. You know, no, no uh, behind the saddle uh, bottles, they're all gone. I only will use a front hydration. I believe that, that in there mostly for the aerodynamic benefit of that. Uh, and like you, you know, obviously I would still wear an aero helmet and do all those little things. Uh, if I'm traveling, it, it, not like like you would just sort of come across a race that's different, but for a uh, for an event, if we were, we were competing in it, I would, I would put my disc wheel on and all that, for, even for whatever marginal gains we can get for uh, for the bike. I have a different pair of bike shoes for sprint versus uh, iron distance. So my bike shoes for the um, sprint are just one big Velcro strap, easy on, easy off. Uh, not as comfortable as my shoes that I use for uh, an iron distance event. No socks like you for either the bike or the run for a sprint. Socks on both for an iron distance. Uh, just that, again, that comfort to be able to go for a long period of time. And then on run, I, I guess super shoes, as long as they're easy to get on. <laughs> the ones that I'm using now are, uh, they are not easy to get on. And I actually had to cut the tongue a bit to be able to get them on. And, and I don't trust trying to put them on too quickly. So I'd make sure that whatever shoes I am wearing in a sprint, they're easy to get on quickly. And uh, and hat visor, I probably would still go with that, but uh, those are not um, uh, as critical in a sprint. Glasses, whatever, you know, the weather conditions uh, uh, lead to at that point. but. Yeah, but for, for iron distance, a lot of my um, my gear choices are, are comfort related, trying to make sure that I'm gonna be comfortable. Like you, you know, cover as much skin as possible with clothing uh, if I can, uh, have as much water available for, within reason uh, during, uh, during the bike. And, and then even on the run, I have even worn a running vest, hydration vest uh, for some races where I, I was worried that maybe the the uh, aid stations would be too far apart, and I didn't want to be beholden to uh, just getting to an aid station to get get fluids and carry it to the next one. Even yeah, I know there's some people that also for the long distance will throw a like cycling shorts on top of their tri tri suit even. Oh, interesting. For, okay, just for more comfort. Um, yeah, I yeah. think that's another little one. It's you know especially if you have issues with saddle fit and saddle. Like I, I know there's people that do things like that. I, my first Ironman, I, I did a full change to run. I put running, uh, actually, no, I just changed the bottoms. I, I put running shorts on yeah. and I don't think that was, a, I don't regret that. That was a, a quick change. I was more comfortable, um, running, you know, running shorts. It would, mm -hmm. That was just at the, time. the last one I did. I didn't do that. Yeah. And yeah. change shorts you got to make sure you have a changing tent so <laughs> exactly it's that's yeah, yeah. No, exactly. 3.3s don't typically have them now right 
Exactly. It's pretty rare for them to have them. Uh, so. oh, well, we covered a lot of ground right. during the contrasting sprints and, you know, the two ends of the spectrum, both yeah. fantastic distances to race. We both enjoy racing the, racing the full range of these distances, and there's no easy. You don't say, oh, I just did the sprint. No, the sprint is just as hard as other events. There, it's just a different kind of hard. Yep. Yeah, you're going to be uncomfortable in both yeah. just for a yeah. different amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, and we're going to get right, you well, to Vegas. Pardon me? Speaking of being uncomfortable, we're going to get you back to Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Well, for a little time. Yeah. <laughs> I still got a, I still got another month of summer. But yeah, I'm coming back on uh, on Sunday, and uh, I'm I'm bracing for bracing for the heat. My treadmill is going to get a good workout, I think, in the next ten days. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, any All other right, uh, last points you want to hit on? No, I think we're good. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this, and uh, we'll be back at it next week. Awesome. All right. Let me see if I can push the buttons in reverse correctly. Just a second. No, that's not it.